welcome to another session of the Sandbox. And uh, we've got Dina with us today, and we will be exploring in this Sandbox how permaculture came into Dina's life and what she learned about it, what she'll be integrating into her life uh, about this going forward as well. And from what I understand, permaculture came into her life at a point when there was a lot of chaos and frenzy um, and hysteria in the world due to uh, the, the pandemic during the early stages of this lockdown. And it became one of those philosophical slash practical spaces uh, that she could feed, you know, and, and, and kind of bring in the sense of resilience and, and self-sufficiency. And so she's been researching into it and finding practical ways to apply it back into her life. So let's warmly welcome Dina and um, let's, her, let's bring her in with our presence and witness as she shares her experience. Hi everyone, um, I'm Dina. Um, I'm kind of nervous, but uh, <laughs> gonna try and do this well. Um, yeah, so I'm 21. Um, I was at uni in London when the pandemic first hit. Um, and then my mum was living in Bath, so which is kind of like in the countryside in Somerset. And um, yeah, when I came here, I kind of like, it just hit me what was happening. And I don't know, there was like a real sense of fear, like I think everyone felt. Um, and one thing that really, what kind of hit me was the fact that like the food shortage, well, food shortage um, that was going on and the idea that like, we wouldn't be able to like meet our basic needs of like having and eating food. Um, and I'm not sure, but that just led me down like multiple rabbit holes online um, and kind of showed me that we're kind of at the mercy of like, the government or like a centralized government um, when it comes to food like if for some reason that like supermarkets shut or we're not allowed into supermarkets we're kind of helpless um and yeah that kind of led me to discover why like growing your own food is so important um i always thought that it was just something that old people did and it wasn't like necessary to do because we have supermarkets and if we did it, it was just like a hobby to like connect more to the earth or whatever. Um, yeah, and then I kind of realized through also watching this guy called Ron Finley, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of him, um, but he's a gorilla gardener. Um, and he'd done a TED talk that I watched um, and he kind of basically, he lives in central Los Angeles, which, um, where there's loads of like areas of food poverty and just poverty in general. And he started growing food like in spaces that were derelict, like, you know, like in the middle of a motorway where there's just a piece of land that nothing grows on except for weeds. And then he realized that so many people were struggling to afford food and like fruit and vegetables um, as part of, you know, their life, like, work in three jobs and like one of the main things that they were they were working for was to be able to afford food for their children and their families and then um, he realized that if he or if he and like the community can grow food in these areas that aren't being used um he can kind of solve this and not only does it create community and um yeah like emotional support um like a community feel um it also basically takes like one worry off of people. Um, yeah, and I don't know if that really like resonated with me because even growing up in London um, in like different areas of different privilege, I've moved around quite a bit, but there were certain areas and people I knew where their parents were really struggling to afford food and like fruit and vegetables. And that's just something that I don't think anyone should have to worry about. And no one should need to worry about that. Um, and the fact that we're paying for fruit and vegetables is just a bit of a scam, um, I think. Like, it's something that we can grow. We have compost, we can create compost and we can grow our own food. So that was, yeah, that was kind of like my introduction to it. 
Um, and yeah, a few things that he said really like sparked something in me. Um, he said, growing your own food is like printing your own money, um, which I thought was really cool. And it created a lot of like, like in a time where everything was like really unstable and I didn't have a sense of security. I felt like growing my own food could give me that and like give me a sense of autonomy and like control over my own life. Um, just knowing that I had that basic need met. Not that I had anywhere to grow food because I was living in like a temporary flat, but the idea that I could have that um, or like I could create a community that would do that gave me like a lot of hope. And um, yeah, he also says that it's one of the most revolutionary acts that you can do to grow your own food because there's nothing that can be kind of taken away from you. Like no one or no government can kind of starve you or I don't know, like you're not at anyone's mercy to be able to survive. Um, so yeah, and then that led me to discover permaculture um, which is basically, it's technically a regenerative form of agriculture. Um, and I'm actually doing a course in it now, but I'm not very, like, I'll be honest, I'm not very good at like the biology of it or like the pH of the soil or like that stuff. <laughs> I'm like more interested in it as like a concept and a theory of like being able to apply it to different things. Um, so yeah, it's basically, in essence, it's, it's quite hard to define, but it's basically um, working with the land and helping it thrive um, with us as like its stewards instead of conventional agriculture, which is just kind of like doing whatever to the land to create food, which is sold and creates money for the farmer. Um, yeah, that's basically it. But um, one of the main things that really um, I don't know, drew me to it was the idea that it holds that humans aren't the virus. And that's something that I feel like I saw everywhere um, on social media when the pandemic first hit, that like humans are the virus and we're ruining everything and we're the reason why everything bad is happening, which is kind of true, but um, it's also not because if we flip that, um, and within permaculture, humans are actually like the best thing that could happen to the planet if we want it to be. And um, that we have the power to decide if um, we're going to be something that destroys everything or something that really gives life to everything and helps it thrive. Um, and we don't have to be a virus. We can actually be something that helps it thrive beyond what it would even by itself. Um, so yeah, um, that's kind of like the first part. And um, permaculture basically has around 12 principles. Um, I think depending on who you ask, it has a few extra ones, um, but I can read some of them out. But um, the main thing about it is that it can be applied to everything. So it's not just agriculture. Um, for example, one of them is to integrate and creatively find ways to support different plants so like I forgot exactly what plants it was I think James can help me out but if you <laughs> put um two plants next to each other um for example one has I'm just kind of making this up but the theory's right um <laughs> say one plant has like a lot of magnesium naturally and another plant doesn't if you put them next to each other they can kind of support each other and help each other balance out and thrive um, compared to a lot of agriculture nowadays, which just kind of plants things in rows and regardless of whether they help each other or not. And um, yeah, you can apply this to anything. You can apply this to relationships, um, romantic relationships, friendships, institutions, education, like um, making sure that you see the context of that particular thing and really understand it and see what could individually go next to it to help it if that makes sense um yeah ways of like organizing creatively that are helpful um and really taking into account what you're growing next to each other or putting next to each other um yeah and another one is small and slow solutions um 
So we don't always need to completely change everything suddenly. Um, we can observe, that's one thing like in permaculture, before you design your garden based on your needs and that specific land's needs, you always observe the um, garden for a year, so at least four seasons, um, which I think is really beautiful um, in like whatever you do as well. Um, and you use like small and slow solutions, you see if something works and then if it does, yeah, I think James just put the thing for it up there. That's really interesting. Um, if you guys wanted to look at the link. Um, yeah, I thought I was going with that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I watched a video um, the other day as well um, on this guy that was practicing permaculture. Um, he kind of like, put it into like a short sentence, but he said that before he does anything in his garden or on his farm, he asks, is this healing? Um, that was like a question that came before anything that he did. Um, and I thought that was really beautiful. Um, and that could obviously be applied to everything. Um, and also it kind of allows things to not be like, there's not one solution for everything, which is something else that I really like about permaculture. It's very adaptive and it's very based on the specific um, situation. Like you don't just have one fertilizer for everything that you use on everything. Like one thing that you may use for a cucumber may not be something that you use for a sweet corn. Like you really have to watch and see if that's what it needs. Um, just like if you ask if eating a cucumber for lunch is healing, it might be yes for one person. And for another person, maybe it's not, like maybe a burger is more healing in that moment. Um, if someone has a bad relationship with food, like as much as a cucumber is like a healthy whole food, maybe a burger is what they need to like heal that relationship with food based on their experiences and their like specific, um, and their personality and stuff, um, which is something obviously you can apply to vegetables, you can apply to education, which is something I'm really interested in as well. Um, how teachers treat individual students in the classroom, everyone learns completely differently. Um, and just like your permaculture garden, treating every student the same is not going to work very well or allow them to thrive. Um, how you seat children next to each other in the classroom, like the three, what was it, the three sisters thing that James put up. Um, I don't know, three students next to each other might not help each other thrive like a different combination would. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what most of the stuff that I've learned and that permaculture's taught me. Um, not a lot of biological things, but I'm like completely like good at knowing or practicing yet because I've only just, um, yeah, Kiss the Ground is a really good documentary. I've watched that. That's really amazing. Um, I definitely recommend that. Um, and yeah, I think for me, like just being at the beginning of this permaculture journey um, and not knowing like specific details about the science of it um it's just really like helped shift my perspective on everything and kind of the idea that it doesn't have to just be for old ladies or like hippies or i don't know any kind of stereotype like it's something that you can apply to your normal life and the things that you like like um practicing permaculture and being sustainable doesn't mean that you have to like sacrifice or give up your nice clothes or your nice car like it's more about finding ways to have those luxuries and those nice things that you want and you desire but making that sustainable like um for example permaculture in architecture doesn't have to mean that we all live in sustainable little straw huts like it can still mean that we creatively um, like create really beautiful houses and different shapes and weird forms um, but just that the way you do that is sustainable and can be adapted um, so yeah that's kind of 
it. Um, I don't know if like James has any questions that I can answer. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed yeah you sharing that and like piecing it together. I think the act of you bringing it to the space it, in my mind is a part of that process, which is um, kind of how can you grow with other people? Like how can you grow with us in the space? But before we get into like the, the discussions and back and forth, um, me and Sim were thinking prior to this event, like a good way to kind of bring everyone into the space in a non-committed way is if we could um, say one word association that comes to our mind based on what Dina just shared. So it, and it doesn't matter if someone else has said it as well. Um, so I can start and then I'll choose someone on my screen and whoever I choose can choose someone else. And then once we've all gone, then we can, um, yeah, then we can get into more of a dialogue ask questions to Dina or even make suggestions because it's not just about uh, yeah asking Dina about all the theory and the scientific aspects of permaculture. Okay, the word that came up for me as Dina was speaking was light, like a little bright light. And I'm gonna pass it on to Alice. Um, okay, my word is city. And I'm going to pass it on to uh, Felix. I think the, uh, the word that I'd like to bring now is uh, thought. And particularly, I don't know if they, I couldn't think of how you put it into just one word, but the slowing of thought and taking more, oh, consideration. Yeah, that would be, <laughs> that would be it. Um, I'm going to pass on to Emmanuel. Um, the word collaboration, uh, I'm going to pass it on to Cardinal. Um, I thought of resistance. Uh, I'm doing, I'm reading a lot about Michel Foucault and that's just like the, th the first thing that came up to my mind when, especially when Dina was talking about like the centrality of the government and being like independent, like independence and sustainability. Oh, sorry, uh, I would, uh, I could, one second, I would say beta. The word that highlighted to me was healing. That was my experience with connecting with uh, nature. I'm gonna pass it on to Isaac. A uh, word that came to my mind was practical. It seemed like a very practical way for um, a future-based lifestyle. I guess similar to Beta, but my word was touch, like touching the soil and really connecting with it. I'm gonna pass it on to Esther. Um, so my word would be nourish or nourishment. Um, and I'm going to pass it on to Maria. Um, my word is different. So I really like the idea of every plant, you know, you need to take care of in a different way and sort of um, putting that onto the classroom as well. I thought that, yeah, that was a beautiful comparison. I'll pass it on to Wahid. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, my word is effort. And I think um, just sort of listening to all of that just makes you realize how little effort um, what I was putting into sort of this um, and that's something I'd like to put more of into. Um, my person that I'd like to pass it on to is Adam. Hi guys, I was thinking healing. I'd like to pass it on to Josh. Um, oh, I have two, but I'll just pick one. Um, I would say um, breath, because I guess it's kind of what uh, kind of almost most directly connects us to nature and things. And also like, I think it's become something people have thought about in the last like 
year in the context we're all in now. So it's kind of like a, yeah. Um, who is left? Um, Rowan, I don't know if you've been. Hi, I'm not sure if you can see me. <laughs> I can't see me. Um, oh, it's very dark. Uh, my word is abundance um, as opposed to scarcity. And uh, I will pass it. Has Sol um, spoken yet? Yeah, hi, Sarla. Um, my word would be family. As like Dina said, um, it's not just for grandmothers to plant the gardens, but grandmothers for sure can pass it down to the next generation, which is how nature can keep growing and becoming more and more beautiful. Um, to the person, Grace. Um, my word is holistic because everyone is in some way affected by nature. Yeah, uh, my word, I think, is um, intuition. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting when that kind of stemmed from when Dina was talking about like a combination um, and sort of like a combination, I think, of three students kind of like maybe not working as well as kind of another combination of three students. And I think yeah, intuition just in the sense of kind of like finding your own kind of connection to like permacultural and natural growing things that is kind of, you know, unique to your circumstance and kind of, you know, uh, um, emotional intuition as well as intellectual intuition, just kind of following kind of that, that, that pathway. Um, my word would be relearning, um, meaning I need to revisit lots of things that I've learned, I've been taught uh, and make decisions what I need to relearn in order to adapt more and better, more harmoniously. And I have no idea who hasn't been yet. Josh, perhaps? I've been, but it gets harder the later you go in these things. Who's, who's left? Dina. 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 Um, I'm, not, um, I'm not sure. I think the only word that comes to my mind right now is nervous. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. Yeah. In general, a word for permaculture for me is, um, yeah, I think holistic, like Grace said, like really taking into account everything for what it is and then making decisions from that. And that, you know, are healing and will create something better. Yeah. Cool. cool. Wow. Um, that was, yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Sim. I absolutely loved that exercise. Um, I may have missed some few words, but I wrote down some of the words I picked up. Sim probably wrote down a lot. So we've got healing, breath, effort, family, holistic intuition, relearning. If there's a word I missed, feel free to put it in the chat. And yeah, just looking at the chat and the dashes in between the different words and how they kind of resistance. Yeah, I loved resistance. That was um, Colin's word, city, yeah. Um, I think just even just looking at those words together and how they, they kind of combine it's like a really interesting thing for me of how we've all managed to combine in this room um, with our different interpretations. Whereas if we only had maybe just Dina speaking or one professional in permaculture, we may not have had, oh, Simran's got the whole, oh yeah, my word, light. Simran's got the whole list there. I think I'll read it out again. Um, We've got light, city, consideration, collaboration, resistance, healing, practical, touch, nourish, different, effort, healing, breath, abundance, family, holistic, intuition, relearning, holistic, nervous. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the thing with me and the reason why I kind of invited you, Dina, to come here and talk about permaculture, because 
for me, when I first ran into it a few years ago, it was, yeah, it was deeply rooted in the philosophical implications um, of what permaculture like did to the way I related to people. Um, and that would be the thing I would kind of invite people in the room to think about as well. Um, whether you look into permaculture more or don't, I think it's a really interesting realm to navigate. Um, and yeah, as always, in, if you guys want to elaborate a bit more, just leave the exclamation mark in the chat box and I'll call on you to elaborate further on the words. Um, but before we do that, I'm kind of interested in like Simran, what do you think? How, how did that make you feel watching everyone go around and do you have any thoughts? I found quite a lot of things connecting. So um, I had two words as well in my pocket. I started off with sunlight and then I felt, oh, you said light. And then I broke my own rule of changing the word uh, to a different one, um, which was touch because that was the next one I had in mind. And yeah, you can see, you know, words like healing, breath, abundance, they kind of, you know, they're usually used in, in the same um, or in similar sentences. Um, holistic, so there's so much about just like rejuvenation, like, you know, kind of growing and, um, and thriving and living and all these words just come together and they create new ones, right? And how interesting is it that you see these words and new words come up as you do that? Um, and so, yeah, it just feels like this is a proverbial watering can of like new thoughts and new um, ideas to do with permaculture. So yeah, I just found it fascinating. What do you think, Dina? I mean, you're seeing these words and do you feel like in your journey, um, you know, uh, starting off with this, you kind of touched on this, right? Like that um, there is the, the biological, like the more scientific aspect of permaculture, but there's so much you can learn and, and kind of understand about humans and human societies through this one very specific, very niche practice. Um, and so, yeah, like, you know, you see these words and they're not really scientific or they're not, you know, um, very specific to, um, to the, the practice of permaculture itself. Um, and you can extrapolate it into different societies. So what did you make of it? And do you, um, like, do you find yourself having changed as a result of, of learning, uh, of learning this practice? Uh, yeah, I think I have. I think um, permaculture for different people is different. Like for some people it is really scientific and that can benefit us and the community in like a really amazing way because, you know, we get actual fruit and food and product from it um and that's on like a very base level which is just as important as looking at it from like a more theoretical perspective or something that you can apply to different institutions and stuff that aren't food but I think yeah the fact that it's originally from something that is food and growing and from the earth um that's kind of like the base of us, like biologically, like we come from the earth and that's kind of our um, origin. Um, so whether we use permaculture to literally grow food or use the principles to apply it in like different institutions or um, yeah, use it to create community and it's kind of up to us. And yeah, I found the words like I love how differently everyone can interpret them and the principles themselves are really vague which I really like because you can kind of make what you want of it um, you can apply it to so many different things you can yeah and someone asked me what food have I grown what I have yeah I've only ever grown tomatoes and I'm growing kale right now so not a lot um, I'm like definitely a beginner um, but yeah, I hope one day that I can have my own garden and land and um, stuff where I can grow my own food and be like self-sufficient. But yeah, right now it's not completely. I think that's another thing about permaculture. Like it's not about having a massive plot of land where you can create like a garden of Eden necessarily. 
Um, one of the principles actually is making creative use of margins. Um, and that can mean anything like for me when I was living in a flat and I was growing tomatoes, that meant using like the one tiny meter of space that was possible to put like a plant pot onto and grow like two tomatoes. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my take on it. Um, and I think that's important to know because even when I first started it, I was like, oh, I need, when I'm like 35 and I have a massive plot of land, then I can do permaculture. But um, no, you can literally just do it from your uni accommodation, like even just growing some herbs, like that's the whole point of it, just doing it from where you are and with what you have and using your space creatively. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to like pick up on here, um, Adam just said, how much more satisfying is it growing your own food versus picking it up from the supermarket? And I wanted to like pair up with that of, say you said you've grown a tomato, um, how did it taste? <laughs> or how big was it? Or yeah, tell us about the tomato. And unfortunately, before it actually grew the actual, it was really massive, but I'm, like before the tomato actually came, um, I left for Spain for two months, so I had to give it to a friend. And um, I'm not sure how they taste, but apparently they taste really nice. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I'm yet to eat something that I've grown, <laughs> but I can imagine that it tastes a lot better. Um, I think I've grown one thing before. I think I grew strawberries when I was 13 and I remember eating it and it's the satisfaction of like all the effort and love you put into it. Um, and you know the energy that you put into that food or fruit or vegetable. Whereas when you buy from the supermarket, um, you're not really sure like what kind of energy went into it. Um, if like the person planting it, what they used in it, um, if they were having a, a horrible day, like I think that kind of affects the actual um, growth of the fruit and vegetable as well, like who's planting and what kind of energy they have. Um, so yeah. <laughs> there is a point from Conrad saying, in Kent, you can find Deep Adaptation Research Center focusing on permaculture and deep adaptation to the context of climate change. That's interesting. Um, and then there's a question from Emmanuel. Do you want to unmute and- uh, Oh and yeah, so, yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask Dina, let's, um, if you don't have access to like a garden um, or like a plot of land, like how would you recommend like being able to experience like, growing your own food or like, yeah actually getting involved in growing your own food not just like picking up food that someone else is growing but actually like being hands-on if you don't have like that available um so yeah that's something that i was really interested in as well because i never really had the land or space to grow my own food as i thought i should um but yeah urban permaculture is like a really big thing so one way is just growing like herbs and tiny pots on your windowsill that's something that almost everyone can do. Little pots on windowsills in all different climates. Um, even just growing like parsley on your windowsill and putting it on your food, like that's so much satisfaction. Um, if you have a balcony, which I think you men you have, um, there's a lot of stuff that you can grow on a balcony. Um, there's a lot of I'm not completely like sure on exactly what fruit you can grow, but I'm sure you can find out. And um, another thing that I never really thought of was like, um, there are so many permaculture farms that love having volunteers to help them grow their fruits and vegetables and um, learn from them. So I'm actually volunteering every Wednesday at a permaculture farm garden thing. Um, and just like, that's the best way to learn, I think as well. Um, because I'm doing my course online and it, it's very different um, than like having hands-on experience. So yeah, just finding like allotments, plots of land around you. There's so many um, that want volunteers and people to kind of contribute. And that's another point of permaculture, kind of that community um, and that really creates that community. So yeah.
Finky. Um, yeah, uh, that's why I said city, because um, yeah, because it would be amazing if a if a city could be if people in cities could be sustainable, like actually eat. I don't know. When I was living in London, I was walking down the streets, and the only way I could survive because I started to go crazy in that city. <laughs> But um, but like what I would do is I would walk down the streets and try to because everything you I could see was just like oh my god everything's so dark and it's just destroying everything and it's toxic and it's it's killing us and just like ah a nightmare and then I was like okay uh, let's 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 pick let's change let's put a picture let's make a collage on top of, of things that I would like to see instead and it was like these beautiful green streets and all the different um i mean there's all these beautiful um green spots in cities and they're not that big some of them they're maybe just in the middle of a roundabout but um and also a lot of trees and they're never fruits and they're never food trees or food things and so i was always imagining like um yeah back gardens and every everything that's like still land and i think they do this in I remember reading something about um, there's that city in America that got um, collapsed or something that um, Eminem was from there or some you know the, the city anyway that city collapsed Detroit emptied, Detroit, Detroit yeah. emptied and then they they grew loads of things there in the and then yeah the community grows and all of the nice things that come with it um, yeah, I would like to see that happen. Um, yeah, I was in Bristol like three months ago and um, I just walked past an estate, um, just like a normal like council estate. And uh, there was a lady who was like growing stuff and in front of loads of like um, kind of blocks of flats that are like council houses and stuff, there's usually like really massive patches of just dry grass um which no one really uses um and she I went and talked to her and she actually asked the I don't know the council or the owner of the flats like hey can I just grow food here for my community and um yeah most of them like usually let you and uh, she was telling me how her and like a few other flats were just rotating and growing food in their kind of patch of grass in front of their um, flats. And she just said that in the summer, they had so much, like they had so many vegetables that um, they just had too many and they were just giving it away to friends and family. And that's the kind of abundance like that is so nice and so necessary as well for certain communities and stuff who can't afford that. Um, and yeah, just realizing that like a lot of the times it, it is free and if like we make the effort, um, especially people who are more privileged, if they make the effort to create these spaces in communities that are less privileged, that could really um, help as well. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna try and weave in some of the comments I saw. Um, Conrad shared a Facebook group on Deep Adaptation Research Center. I think they're really good folks if people want to save the chat. Um, Maria wants to elaborate a little bit. I'll, I'll let you do that next. But also Dina's, um, I think Dina's mother, Vita, shared about um, just growing the tomato in the house, just add it to the vibe of the space. And I think that is equally as, uh, as beautiful as eating the tomato. Um, okay, I'm gonna pass it over to Maria um, on what you wanted to elaborate. I just read my own comment and I'm such a bad multitasker. I basically described permaculture by saying, can I elaborate on growing food? Um, but I can't listen and write at the same time. Um, I was just thinking about what you were saying to do with like appreciating what you've grown because you've spent that time and effort on it. And my, my family, from both sides but especially my dad's side everyone is in agriculture and so they have their own gardens and everyone grows their own food and I know nothing about it but that's how my aunts and uncles live their lives and my aunt was explaining that to grow one single biological carrot it takes six months and even a supermarket carrot takes three months to grow so with loads of chemicals and 
and things like that. And to think that we just let these carrots rot in our fridges after it's taken three to six months to grow is absurd. And so I think when you have that mentality because you live it, you know, you're just not going to let food go to waste. You'll find, you know, we give it to the chickens, I guess, in my aunt and uncle's case. But, you know, you, there's no way you're going to let as much food as we do go to waste if you realize the importance of that. But I think you can't fully grasp it until you do it yourself. But um, yeah, thank you, Gina. I just thought about that, which I hadn't thought about for, for a long, long time and thought it'd be nice to share. But um, this has really got me thinking. So thank you. Uh, yeah, that was really interesting. I actually didn't really know that, seeing as I haven't really grown much myself. Um, yeah, that was really interesting. Um, I've never thought about food waste as much um, like when I was studying this. So yeah, thank you for sharing. <laughs> I'm now wondering if I got my facts completely wrong and I just threw six and three months out there. So if anyone knows better, you can correct me. <laughs> just realized there might actually be food growers on this. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the facts I remember. So I love I love this um, city folks talking about the mythology of growing food. Like I've heard of this thing in a far, far away land where people grow things. Um, yeah, I'm so fascinated that if if we track back like a few a few decades back, um, the majority of people and actually till now the majority of the world grow their own food um, but we don't really know about it and I think another bit I wanted to add instead of just like being on your high horse and saying uh, like it's a bit of a privilege to grow land because I think the history of the reason why people don't grow food anymore is because they've been pushed off their land and pushed into cities to work so it makes it hard for people to find places and we get like slowly and more slowly disconnected from it um, but I think having these conversations and interweaving like permaculture, even in places where we can't grow food and recognizing natural processes in our relationships and in the way in which we connect with people, I think that could be part of that stepping stone to get us um, not necessarily back, but just like a, a new kind of relationship with um, natural cycles. Okay, all right. Emmanuel, go on. You've got a comment there. I feel like you, you have a lot of thought to that. So I'll let you know. Obviously, yeah, this is a new topic for me, but I like it. But I was just, I wanted to ask, um, like, do you think, uh, obviously this question is just a question out there, like, because obviously I've never grown anything in my life. Like, you know, the concept of growing stuff, I mean, I understand it, but it's a bit like, you know, it's interesting. Um, obviously I, I have eaten food before, so I definitely know where it comes from, but I wanted to ask like, do you do you think that like because we're very like I mean I'm from London, you can probably tell from the accent. So like growing food is like not something we that we personally do, but do you think just like other things which like do you think it's something which that like, as humans by us not doing it, like is it is it wired into us to want to grow food? Because like like yeah, do you think it's something that's like part of us like as a human or is it just yeah? Yeah, that's the question. Question mark, what is... Yeah, um, yeah, I want to add, um, I don't know, I don't know how to answer you, but, um, sorry, but I want to add that um, I was thinking, yeah, people in cities, um, people in cities, uh, there are all these massive buildings with offices, and I don't know what they're doing in those offices, but like loads of people in offices. And that's what they do and that's the job and they spend hours of their life just doing that and earning money off that and they're helping something work uh, but there's so many of them and so many people do that so it's like okay um we need food right we need to eat and and so there's like so for a bit i was thinking i, I mean it's oversimplified i have no idea how it works but if the if it's like okay let's just take it down to the minimum people need to eat what if it was a little bit more like it used to be that if you need to eat, then you grow the food. Like when I was when I was living there, I was thinking 
mm, what if instead of all these people working, what, what, would these people that have to copy and paste every day, if they are copying and pasting, I don't know, instead of doing that, they had to, I don't know, spend three, day, three hours a day, Monday to Thursday, <laughs> going to plant some potatoes or oh take making sure that the plants are watered and um and if that like i mean again it take it's it's not like i'm just I'm, it's super simple but um yeah just imagining instead of mm. like this uh repetitive monotonous job in this in the office is that yeah. natural for humans and is it much nicer to work in? I don't know. Maybe neither. Neither is. Uh, maybe it's great that we have robots. I don't. I don't know. But um, yeah. What, what, yeah. And and also, can we can we grow enough food um, in small gardens, or do we need uh, these massive fields? Can can a city be growing food for itself? I don't know. Yeah, I think um, I'll, I'll add a little bit to what Alice said, which is actually a cyber, um, a friend of the space, her and her family, they do this project where they get people who work in, um, in like office jobs and they bring them to the school allotment where they grow their food, like, um, and they do a volunteer package and collaborate with that local community and the school. So the gardens in a school. Um, and I've been to that and like helped so that's really cool. Um, thanks. I will just read my question out, I guess. So how does permaculture fit in, if at all, in dumpster diving and any other attempts or methods to reclaim food from being considered food waste, which now I believe is criminalized? Uh, would, would anyone have any kind of um, answer to um, that? That's great. Yeah, you, I think, um, how do you feel about elaborating it on it, Conrad? Because I feel, I feel like you might have some wisdom to the reason why you asked that question. Um, do you see a connection there? Um, I, I'm just curious about um, food production um, and um, preserving the food that already exists, that's been produced, that's been, it's been grown, but for different reasons, certain politics. Uh, sometimes profit-oriented or often profit-oriented and uh, marketing strategies, some food that has been already grown and is perfectly fitting into human consumption and animal consumption is being disposed. And now there are attempts to criminalize that for different reasons as well. I, again, I have this theory that to preserve the, or to maximize the profits of selling things that are allowed to be sold um, so I, I, I'm just wondering whether the, an attempt to, to save the food that's already been grown um, could be a part of permaculture or not, or it's just a separate thing. It's very interesting there. One of the principles of permaculture is actually um, like creating no waste. Um, so whether that means like taking um, a carrot that is extra and giving it to the chickens or even just composting it or um yeah just using it in any way that isn't kind of just not beneficial at all i'm not really sure if that answers your question but um, yeah I'm not sure if anyone else has anything but yeah having creating or like striving to create no waste is one of the principles so i think that kind of links into the dumpster I'm not sure what that term was, but is it the one where they kind of take um, food like waste from industrial kitchens and you know make meals for um, like homeless shelters and things? So yeah, that does fit into farm culture, I think. I would also say it helps us understand why there is waste and why there is scarcity at the same time, right? Like on one hand, you have like excess stuff that's being produced but not consumed and then on the other hand you have people who, are, who just cannot get enough and you realize is there something fundamentally wrong in in the market system right does it artificially create scarcity by blocking the flow between the source and the consumer and um, when you sort of get into this idea of saying okay you know you can produce there is there's land as a resource to produce you know, and to, and to grow 
um, why is it that people still starve? And I think it, it helps kind of really understand where the issue comes from and, and it brings a political perspective into it. But I'm not sure if, um, I wouldn't know if, if it can provide solutions at such a systemic level, at such a wider level. I guess um, my, my, I was actually gonna go down a similar route. Um, it kind of like link up a few things, a few people said. I don't wanna tread on your toes, James, <laughs> the master doc <laughs> facilitator. But um, someone, someone earlier said about, uh, Cardellan said about resistance and um, James kind of talked about the history and I guess like it made me realize there's like, and uh, I think it was Emmanuel said about, is it a natural thing that we should want to grow food? And someone said, is it natural? We should be on our computers all the time. And I guess it makes me think like, you know, before the land was like a common thing. If you wanted water, you went to the well, or if you grew something, it was only divided up into people own this or people own that relatively recently. And there's been like thousands of years of indigenous people around the world, like, you know, practicing permaculture and living that way. So I guess like the historical dimension of that makes us realize how like structured and condition like our relations with nature and food are and it links with what sim said about like this idea that there even could be scarcity is like a produced thing but going off what you said sim of like could permaculture be a solution on a systemic level i think anything that makes you engage with histories like that in a critical way or engage in your relations with the land and others has definitely like the potential almost like a little seed itself to then do that which links with what Cardellan said about like resistance and then there's also like historical examples of if you think about like the Dakota Access Pipeline or the Flint water crisis which links with what Alice said about where Eminem's from but um, <laughs> I can't believe we've got Eminem and that's amazing but the Flint water crisis was like a very produced thing that changed a lot of people's relations with nature not of their choosing and made us kind of reframe like what is a need and how that can be like a point of resistance and then I guess I, I talked about this last week but like um I think mutual aid does like a similar thing of like reframing how we relate to like each other and our needs um so like for me I think it might not be just by practicing by default you are making a systemic solution but maybe it gives you the seed to those kinds of things um yeah well i just wanted to refer to the question that emmanuel asked earlier because uh, there's a part of our human beings basically to grow vegetables and also talking about permaculture i thought what we started the session with and picking the words that well, I took a note of the things that really kind of like brightened up my head about uh, intuition, family, society, connection, relationship, nourish, thriving, growing. I mean, in terms of personal growing, as well as growing stuff, uh, breath, abundance, um, holistic generosity as a kind of like the big one that came to my mind. Uh, and healing, all of this, if you accept that it's all connected, growing things connected to all of these words, I think each one of these words is an essential part of a human being. So therefore, how could growing not be the essential part of human beings? If I can explain it clearly. I mean, as soon as I read um, Emmanuel's question I had no doubt the answer is yes if all of these qualities is part of us and is connected to mother earth and growing vegetables so yes growing things it is part of our um, natural being or essential part of our human beings but unfortunately it seems like pretty much forgotten and I'm including myself and it's coming out again 
doing uh, awareness and just kind of like appreciation and being more conscious about the ground that I put my feet on, the food that I eat and it comes from there, the sun that put lights on it and therefore it nourishes it. So all of these things are all so beautifully connected together and that makes us be who we are. That's all I just wanted to say. Yeah. Thank you, for appreciate it. thank you. Um, I don't know if I can just like quickly reply to that. Uh, I really agree with you. Um, I think like for it being part of our DNA, I do agree. I do think it's part of our DNA. But I think like what I noticed in my own little process was that when I first discovered permaculture, I was like, oh my gosh, like everyone's a grower, everyone's a farmer. And as I learned about it more, and I still am, I'm realizing that as much as I love it, um and and like applying it in different ways i feel like my passion personally does not lie in spending all day like growing vegetables personally and as much as i think it is essential like i think everyone should you know know how to cook and cook sometimes and you know connect to their food or you know do their hair and stuff but like not everyone wants to be a hairdresser kind of thing um, so I think it is like a basic thing within us to like grow our own food and stuff. But I think it's okay if, you know, some people are naturally more drawn towards it and do more of it for the community. And um, like say if there were community gardens and stuff like in the future, instead of everyone having their own personal garden. So if someone was like more into say dancing, they could spend more of their time dancing or creating a business and stuff and they could you know sometimes help grow the food in the community and yeah but I don't think it has to like yeah I don't know if that makes sense <laughs> sorry can I just add something here Dina to what you said I totally understand and get your point but I guess I was more talking about um developing the awareness about growing stuff and also knowing that it is part of us even though we consciously choose not to grow it like when you eat that tomato you can even for a fraction of a second we can just connect to the earth and know where it comes from and appreciate it once it's in our mouths and that i think that's it it doesn't have to we don't have to have our hands in there but just having the awareness like the way that i can even though I am a chef, I'm working with food all the time, but I don't think I've ever been aware of uh, aware of the, the work that's been behind it and the meaning, all the beautiful words that all of you just kind of added today. I don't think I've ever been that much aware of that, to be honest. And that's, that's, the, that's what I was referring to. And I think that's what has the value. And it's not, maybe not necessarily the DNA of our body to do the farming and stuff but I think it's kind of referring to the soul DNA somehow if that makes sense I'm talking about the awareness so yeah thank you I really like um what what everyone um has just in this last like bit been been talking about and I think just with with um with Emmanuel's questions and Bita's response um, it, it made me think of uh, how it's, and then also with Dina saying that it doesn't have to be about growing food. I think there's there's something in the giving of life to anything, and that can, and that it doesn't have to be like organic. It can be the growth of any particular something. It's just like really joyous. It's a really joyful thing um, for human beings, and it, it's like if it can be something very personal, like like a skill that you you have you've developed or like something you've learned or it can be like the relationship like um like Emmanuel mentioned between people um or it can be like something you know within a community as well um and I think also what's what's interesting what Josh I felt like um and what Simran was sort of um uh, allude, uh well yeah we're, we're talking about as well was how um this that that joy is something that used to be like very uh, typical of human living and has sort of disappeared uh, like 
from the mainstream of like uh, you know developed um, society where it's kind of being taken off our hands and it's and it's just a um it's the the fact that the idea of growing your own like food and, and nourishing yourself could seem or now does seem like sort of quite radical I think ties into the way that uh, there's a real sort of dependence that has been like I think Josh used the word conditioned into people and a real dependence on essentially I feel like it does I mean I'm I'm happy for like other other um points on it but I feel like it does essentially boil down to money and like if you make people need to like pay for the ability like the well yeah the access to to food or something like that then it sort of um makes it a lot easier to then I don't know not well yeah make them give up like a lot of themselves or a lot of their time for that for that goal and it just fits into it fits really neatly into um a kind of like industrial capital model um where you can get a lot of people to do things that they don't really want because they need to whereas i think with like this the the hopeful future where people can live in cities that feed themselves it's kind of like a freedom from that that i think is is really nice Really well said. I think we have a point from Esther. Hi, yeah. Um, thank you, Dina, for sharing because I really didn't know anything about permaculture before this evening. Um, and it's also really nice to know how to apply it into different places in your life. Um, I guess I was just thinking about it as things that were said today and also about the waste in supermarkets just because I'm working in a supermarket at the moment and it is I guess it's just strange seeing waste at the end of each night and seeing food very differently um almost becoming like numbers um and quite feeling like they're quite far removed from what they are um and also it kind of becomes like a number game of how many things are in stock and how many people buy it, but not necessarily in a way that I can imagine would make sense in an independent shop or a shop in the past where things kind of weren't necessarily waste and it was a bit more of a natural like chain of like a supply I don't know it just feels um quite false and then weirdly in the last few days there's been like grow your own section in the supermarket so like grow your own strawberries but there's been something I don't know it's kind of like again another packaged up way that feels I guess it's just funny how like a supermarket can repackage an idea um, with maybe some of the same meaning, like the same facade of the same meaning, but it feels very different from what you've described. Um, so it's just funny seeing like, again, how supermarkets can package an idea of maybe um, having a pot wrapped in plastic with a plant in it and selling it for six pounds. And then the idea of like, as you said, taking time to think about growth and what grows and how to do it so it's been nice having these different aspects of what actual permaculture is oh i just want to i want to add one thing about the, the food waste in a in a in a bakery of a friend and it's a small business so i was like oh what do the small businesses do and i ask a lot of bakeries what do you do at the end of the day and they um, a lot of them give them to these uh, like food banks but my friend the, uh, some of them they throw in a, they give to food banks but the brioche because they the cr brioche you understand brioche in a croissant they burn them they bring them home and they use them for fire <laughs> so I mean there is to an extent even a small business like a, a really small family business is 
producing food waste because you don't know how many bakeries and I don't know what I'm trying to say with that it's just I thought it was weird I was ah small places they eat brioche at home but they don't eat brioche at home every day and then they've run out of friends to give brioche to and then yeah I don't know and the bread maybe, maybe, yeah <laughs> maybe the answer is for people to have more friends from their maybe <laughs> out on the street I don't know people will take it I don't know yeah um okay I feel <sighs> I feel we might be coming towards a closing um if anyone wants to share anything eagerly you can just jump in like Alite did um but <laughs> I'm going to thank you all for being here tonight I really appreciate it every single one of your kind of sharing and points have really been a part of this event and thank you, Dina, for like igniting this conversation. Um, I'm also going to mention next week, we have Kieran. Um, Kieran is been doing exactly kind of what we're talking about, Liche, like food waste and feeding communities. And she, used to, she still does run these community gatherings where she feeds people who can't afford it based on food waste. So she's going to be talking about that and her kind of venturing into creativity and much more stuff like that. So yeah, thank you. Thank you once again. Um, I'm going to pass you on to Sim and Simran's going to wrap it all up for us and tuck us in so we can go and have dinner or sleep, whatever we get up to tonight. All right, we're going to wrap it up with just another moment of quiet. Um, guys, if you could unmute again and um, just take in all the sounds um, and integrate everything. Just allow yourself to feel whatever we felt as a result of these conversations, especially this idea of connecting back with the earth um, and in doing so with ourselves. So two minutes starting now. Thanks, guys. See you next week. Enjoy your evenings. <laughs>